lessons for our students and children so that despite the physical distance, we can provide them deep and meaningful encounters of the mind, heart, and soul that will lead them to you and what you want for them. Unite us to your wounded, sacred heart so that we can help in healing our world, broken with illness, inequality, and injustice. Teach us to be brave, to trust, and to hope that amidst our fears and uncertainties, you're always there ahead of us to accompany us in your mission that you have shared with us in love. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. In the name of the Father and Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Uh, before we start, uh, may I ask Ms. Chuba, are, do you have a presentation to make for ASPA? Uh, if not, I um, just want to say good morning to everyone. I'm Lilan De La Cruz, Associate Dean for Student Formation, and I will be moderating today's forum. Um, before we proceed, yeah, there's the link to YouTube that you might want to send to your uh, fellow parents. Um, I was asked to briefly introduce the administrators here on this forum, and there are a number of administrators. I won't call all of them uh, one by one. We have, of course, our Vice President for the Leola Schools, Dr. Uh, Marlu Vilches, who will be speaking later. Uh, we have our deans, uh, the dean from the John Gokongwe School of Management, Dean Louis Dumnau, from the Humanities, Dean Jonathan Chua, from the School of Science and Engineering, Dean Banjo Bautista, and from the School of Social Sciences, uh, Dean Nandi Aldaba. We also have our associate deans uh, for academics, for the graduate school, the core curriculum, we, student and administrative services, and their team, which includes MIS, events, facilities, student services, bookstore, health services, and guidance, uh, student formation, and our team, student activities, social concern, campus ministry, discipline placement, PE, and athletics. Uh, we have the registrar and his team, the head of the residence halls, the head of the library, representatives from Central Accounting, the head of admission and aid, and we have Father Johnny Go and his team, for adaptive learning. I hope I didn't miss everyone, anyone, but uh, we have a number of administrators to address your concerns this morning. Just a few things before we start. Once again, please keep your microphones on mute so that we'll have less disturbance. If you have any questions at any point in time, please just place them on the chat and we'll attend to them as soon we as we open up the open forum. Um, and maybe as Pak can put on chat ways by which the parents on YouTube can access the can access them so that the parents on YouTube can ask questions through the ASPAC officers. All right, sige. So let's start um, our forum with a presentation by Dr. Vilches, the Vice President for the Leola Schools. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Leland. May I just prepare now the presentation? I'll mute my, I'll turn off my video. Can you see that? Just want to check if you can see that. Because I can see it. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is um, a presentation with uh, parents. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the parents for the enthusiasm that they have uh, shown in sending us questions and in confirming the last maybe the last time I heard from Cecil about how many, there are about a thousand who said that they were going to um, attend this meeting. 
So since we are unable to accommodate everybody inside the, the Google Meet, I think we have a live stream for this one. So thank you for coming and thank you for the enthusiasm for this. I was just also saying that for a lot of meetings that we had, even with students in the past, very few would come if it's an on-site meeting, but on an online meeting, a whole lot more are being accommodated. So thank you very much for that. I have here a photo of this person running, running towards a mountain. We don't know where this person is going, but certainly the environment is very good and very green. So um, I, I also say to myself that this is probably where, what we're doing, where we are and what is next, we'll continue to run. So, uh, but in that kind of running, we are trying to attain a balance. There's a balance in the Loyola schools. We want to attain a balance between and among being reasonable, being compassionate and being sustainable. So any decisions that we make, um, is anchored in these three, three main uh, characteristics, in fact, or three main perspectives. We want to be reasonable in our decisions, we want to be compassionate, and we want those decisions to be sustainable. So in other words, those decisions are not just made out of knee-jerk reactions. There's a lot of discernment that goes um, as part of the process of decision-making. Decision we have done consultations. I, I know that the parents who are the ASPAC, I'd like to acknowledge them here, the parents, the Athenae school's parents, sorry, it's not patents, I'm sorry, it was late in the morning when I did, sorry. Athenae school's parents council, the ASPAC officers, we met with them and I know that they are here at this meeting on May 8th, we met with them. And then we also met with the students, it was also a very well attended one and some students were saying there were 23,000 who watch the live stream. I don't know from where they were. We certainly don't have 23,000 students. So on May 19, we had uh, that kind of open forum with the students for the undergraduate students. And we had a separate one for the graduate students because graduate students have their own concerns that are different from undergrad students. So, but before, but before we move into where we are right now, I think it's important because some of you asked questions regarding the semester, what happened last semester. So I titled this the semester that was. Of course, it was abruptly aborted and we know that and why. There were P grades. Uh, some people were asking about, are those P grades going to be, continue to be P grades? No, they were, the P grades were only for that semester. And uh, there are going to be catch-up classes for the, during, during maybe the intercession or some other time between then and the first semester. There were refunds and then the question of graduation. I want to take up all of these. But I have a um, quote from this side, from the other side, which we would like to look at as a perspective that we took when we ended that semester and why we gave P grades, because some people are asking, why not our, our sons and daughters who are working hard to get a better grade, but why P grades? So I think it's important for us to recognize that navigating uh, through a very big population in the Loyola schools, we're actually not the biggest in terms of number of students. There are other universities that have, that have got 30,000 students. We only have about 9,000 to 10,000. But still, uh, we realize that from this quote, a herd of animals would only travel as fast as the slowest member of the group. So uh, we're, we're talking here about not leaving anyone behind. So that's the reason why we had the P grades. But there were also options for the graduating students to have a grade that not a P grade, but they had to work harder for that one. But for the others, because there was not enough basis for the grades, for, for, for evaluating the grades, so it was better to have a P grade. And then the details of this, your students know. How we treated the P grades, they know about these things. So maybe if it's possible for you to ask them, we would be grateful if there's a conversation between you and your, and your sons and daughters. Okay, the catch-up classes. 
catching up with the remainder of the second semester. Some are wondering, what about if the courses that were taken up last semester were prerequisite courses? What's going to happen? How are they going to move to the next level? So the Loyola schools, deans, uh, schools, the, the schools themselves, the four schools, have organized workshops or modular sessions as catch-up classes. The students need to contact their departments. There, here are samples of those classes catch-up courses for mathematics, open to all who took these courses last semester, uh, catch-up courses for uh, the John Gohan Way School of Management. Uh, the, as of this time, sorry, this is not Dean Bautista, time. sorry, I get so mixed up now. This is Dean Louis Dumlao for the John Gohan Way School of Management. I know, I'm confused. Oh, no, sorry. Dean Bautista is saying that SOSIA has informed key faculty members from JGSOM and SOS as well for these uh, courses. This is from the SOS. Forgive me for all the lapses I have today. Sorry. This is from the uh, SOS Dean Al uh, Nandi Aldaba about the list of courses. These are very small, you cannot probably <clears throat> read them, but this is just to indicate to you that all the departments have got their act together in terms of the catch-up courses, and so the students will have to uh, contact their departments. The School of Humanities and the Jan Gokung Wei School of Management also have their own catch-up courses. Okay, regarding the refunds, there was some of you apparently did not get information about the mechanics of the refunds. I'm not sure what that, why that happened. We wrote a letter to all the students in May, May it was or late April. We wrote to them to tell them about the refunds, about the 20,000 refund from tuition and 60% from lab fees. So, in essence, the refunds, we, we told us the graduating students, their pay, the refund was going to go to payment for remaining fee charges if they have not paid yet, or they were sent, uh, there was a mode of payment that was, that was uh, announced to them that, so that the refund could be given to parents, uh, students and parents. So, the non-graduating students, we said that they could credit the 20,000 to the next enrollment or they could they could pay whatever it was they, they, that could be used for whatever it was that they hadn't paid yet and there was a payment scheme. We also gave them an option to donate. We have a fund called the Tanglawan Fund. This is a fund that I created during the time of Haiyan, the Haiyan um, typhoon and it was we used that for to support students who had who were victims of Haiyan. That was in 2013. But I think I think Grace had it that a lot more people were donating to the Tanglawan Fund. And I was very pleasantly surprised that it is still alive. And so we have used the funds from the Tanglawan also to help students in need. And, and so they had an option to donate to the Tanglawan Fund. And I, I'm happy to let you know that there was a considerable number of students and parents who said that they were donating to the Tanglawan Fund or to the Dream Team, our disaster response um, re and management team. So that's the situation for the refunds. Uh, talking about graduation, this is the last item here. Our end of year ceremonies, we have the seniors pabaon, which is really a way of sending off our seniors in a more solemn, more um, sober way of sending them. It's a very good ritual. It takes place for <clears throat> an entire day ordinarily on site, <clears throat> but this time, we had it online, so it was maybe an hour or so, but it was staggered. There were some, the, the, there were schools pabaon and there was an LS pabaon. We timed it during the, what would have been the graduation ceremonies dates for LS, which was, which were 29 and 30 May. 
We also have a ritual called Pagahandog. This is awards for leadership and service for the seniors and graduating students. That was also done online. You can actually access this on Facebook. There is also the Dalisayan or the awards for the arts also done online on Facebook. <clears throat> now regarding graduation, we were toying with the idea before of having the graduation in October on site or joining this, this batch with the next batch, which is for the following year. But I think that second option was not um, really, it did not, uh, it, it did not attract any, any traction there. So we have a graduation committee in the Loyola schools that's working on an online graduation in the first semester. So we don't know yet when that would be because we're still looking at schedules that will not run in counter to other schedules at the Loyola schools. But definitely this is going to be online and we are going to announce this once this is done. On the other side of the slide here, I have the um, uh, screenshots of the Loyola Schools Bulletin, which is, you, you can access that on that site. You can have a look at it. There are lots of information there about what we have done this semester. And the, there's a special issue for graduation, which is uh, the front, front thing, the issue is Yumi Briones, the valedictorian for this year. So please feel free, take a look at it, and you, have, you can get more information from that. So now moving forward, after looking back at that last semester, we move forward and we hope we're moving forward with direction. So some of the things that we're going to talk to you about, teaching and learning, the Athena Blue Cloud and training for online learning faculty and students, academic and administrative protocols. We will tell you about the academic calendar, registration process, and some policies for online learning and teaching. And then we're going to look at also Finances, how do we manage finances in terms of fees? So we begin with teaching and learning. I want now to present to you Father Johnny Go. Father Johnny is the director for the Athenaeus Science and Art of Learning and Teaching Institute. And he is in charge of, the, of crafting what we call the Adaptive Design for Learning program, which is the main program that he's going to explain to you about in relation to the Athenae Blue Cloud. So I'll give it now the floor to Father Johnny. Uh, good morning, dear parents. Thank you, Dr. Vilches, for giving me this opportunity to share our plans and directions with our parents. Uh, I've been making also some presentations to different stakeholders, to our faculty, to our administrators, and also our parents, as well as students. And we feel that uh, these uh, forums are very valuable because we are able to get feedback from the parents. So if you will, please allow me to share my screen. Uh, and basically, I will share with you, um, please uh, speak up if you don't see my screen, but basically, I'd just like to describe to you our plans and directions as we shift to a fully online environment this coming term. No? As you know, that's going to be uh, the setup especially for the intercession and the first semester. No? And I'd like to, I was asked uh, by Dr. Vilches to give you an idea of what uh, this might look like, but I'd like to begin by quoting a poem from a Span Spanish poet, Antonio Machado, who says, traveler, your footprints are the only road, nothing else. Traveler, there is no road. You make your own path as you walk. And I begin with this quotation because this is exactly the kind of situation we find ourselves in. We're expected to move forward so that uh, we're able to deliver the kind of online education that your children deserve. But at the same time, I think it's important to acknowledge that we are in new terrain. No? There, there is no map, no? Uh, there is no path. No? And the path will be created as we travel together forward. No? And I'm very happy to share with you my impression of our faculty in the Ateneo de Manila, especially Loyola schools, that there's been great openness and great enthusiasm among our faculty to figure out the way forward. And I think I'm very confident that we will be able to deliver what we are promising your children. No? So 
Uh, the first thing I want to do is just sort of uh, show you a very short teaser about what online Jesuit education might look like. No? So our university marketing and communications office has prepared this very short um, inform, uh, information video about the Ateneo Blue Cloud, which we hope will capture the spirit of what we're trying to do. Ateneo Blue Cloud is Ateneo de Manila's distinct approach to online Jesuit education. It is the virtual campus we are building for our community of learners and educators. At its very core remain the hallmarks of Jesuit education that have defined Ateneo, a drive for excellence that is rooted in compassion. Ateneo Blue Cloud, the school on the hill, is now on the cloud. So that short video so, sort of captures what we're trying to do, what we're trying to communicate. No, But there are three big ideas I'd like to focus on in my presentation. The first is uh, what we're trying to do is not about technology. It's more about learning and formation. So it's not about the technology. It's more about the learning. But it's also not just about academics. It's also about formation. For online education in the Ateneo to be truly Jesuit, we cannot focus on technology. No? Technology is just a means to the end. But neither can we just focus on learning because as we know, what defines Jesuit education is not only the priority of academics, but also perhaps the even greater priority of character and faith formation. And we are confident, and this brings me to the second big idea, that online education will allow us to do that. So if well-designed online learning and formation experiences can be just as effective academically and formatively as face-to-face -face classes, even with a regular class size. This sounds like a subversive or even heretical claim for some people, especially those who are more traditional. But research has shown that online programs can be more effective than face-to-face -face as long as they are designed effectively. No? That's why our faculty right now are quite focused on learning how to design effective online learning and formation programs. No? We believe that the same rigor, the same relevance, and the same personal care can be extended to our students, no? even online. No? I, I think many of us will say that we have a lot of uh, great experiences of face-to-face -face classes where we have uh, fantastic teachers. But I think we also have to admit that there are certain classes where the teaching and learning are not so great. It's quite mediocre. So it's all about the design. If the design is done well, even if it's online, it can even be more effective than face-to-face. -face, no? And this is the standard that we will aim for. So that's the second big idea. No? The third big idea is that, as Dr. Vilches already began to talk about, inclusivity and empathy are very important. No? We are committed that no learner will be excluded or left behind for whatever reason. No? That's why even as we are designing our courses, we are paying special attention to how we can make sure that learners who are at risk of being excluded in an online environment, whether it's due to access or learning style, will not be excluded. So I'll talk a little, we'll talk a little bit about that later. But the idea here is we don't want it to happen that one or two students in our classes will be excluded only because uh, they have trouble getting access on the internet or their learning style does not does not privilege them in terms of the online environment. No? So uh, Dr. Vilsus talked about the adaptive design for learning. This is our own framework for designing online learning and, and formation. No? Adaptive design is actually uh, a real term used to refer to what happens to website layouts when you look at them on a tablet, on a phone, or on a desktop, you will notice that the layout changes. So we thought adaptive design would be a great metaphor for our very own flexible approach to online learning. And when we say flexible, we're talking about the modes of delivery, but also the design of our courses, our academic courses, and our formation programs. Let me explain that a little bit to you so that you get an idea. No? So basically what we want to do is make sure that our faculty are collaborating on a basic design. No? So we have teams of faculty now working on 
designing a par particular uh, academic course or formation program. But having designed that course, having this basic design, every single faculty member, when they're actually designing the course, are expected to add a contextualized layer. What do I mean by this? I should personalize the basic design according to my strength as a teacher, according to my style as a teacher, but also according to the needs of my students. So I'm not just going to give them a one-size-fits-all kind of design. No? Even if we work together on a basic design for a course, once, what, once I'm teaching the course already, I'm expected to customize the course and to personalize the course so that the course will be more uh, effective. So as far as design is concerned, it's adaptive in that sense, but also in terms of modes of delivery. You know? Obviously, we're aiming for a fully online delivery. But since we're quite mindful that some of our students may not have the same uh, regular or reliable internet access, we also want to make sure that every time we come up with a basic design for our courses, there's always a low bandwidth version. What do I mean by this? By low bandwidth version, we mean that we may have a video or a recorded lecture, but we must always make sure there's, o there's at least an audio only version, which is easier to download, or a text only version or transcript of the lecture or the video. This is part of the training of the orientation that all our faculty are undergoing right now. It's not enough to come up with a fantastic lecture on video or an animation on video we must make sure there's a low bandwidth version. At the same time, there's always the option of printing out the online course. No? Uh, our learning management system is Canvas and Moodle. We can print out PDFs of those courses or even EPUB files no? so that our students can come up with an ebook, and they can use that either using a thumb drive or if they want, we can have learning packages which are actually printed out as hard copies. So I think this diagram captures how our courses are meant to be adaptive in terms of the design. That will be the first two layers on top, and also how they're supposed to be adaptive in terms of delivery. You know, so that they can be used online, but also for a low bandwidth version, and also for hard copies. Having said that, I also want to add that uh, we're hoping that by the second semester, maybe we can go, uh, we can already begin to admit our students on campus. We're hoping for that. We're praying for that. We don't know if we can admit everyone at the same time, but whatever the scenario will be, our basic design will be useful. It can be used for a fully face-to-face -face classroom scenario, but it can also be useful for a blended approach where part of the time our students are in class and the other part of the time they're at home doing online learning. So that's the approach that we've decided to do as far as our adaptive design for learning is concerned. No? And uh, as Dr. Vilcha said, our faculty are undergoing an online course, this a professional certificate course called Adaptive Design for Learning. It's actually open to all Jesuit schools and universities. It's a service that Ateneo de Manila is extending to all our schools and universities. There are over 2,000 faculty who are taking this course now. But as far as Ateneo de Manila is concerned, there are 1.5 thousand faculty and formation personnel who are doing this. In the Loyola schools alone, we have 772 faculty and, and formation professionals who are undergoing the course. And the hope is by the time they complete the course, they will have completed designing their courses for the intercession and for the first semester. So as you can see, there's rhyme and reason in the way we're doing our training and preparation for our faculty. We're not just asking our faculty to, you know, uh, resort to their own devices and come up with their own design. There's an, there's an organized um, way that we're trying to do this so that all of us will be on the same page and all of us will be able to reach the standard that we are aiming for. Um, so what will the online education offered by the Atena de Manila look like or sound like? Dr. Vilches requested me to sort of give you a little bit more about uh, some materials that you can use to imagine what your children, what your sons and daughters may be undergoing. No? So for this, uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, basically it will be fully online for the intercession no? and for the first semester. And when, you're, when, you're, when your sons and daughters log on to our learning management system, this is what they're going to see. They're going to see the Ateneo Blue Cloud uh, brand there. But I think, let me just sort of clarify to you some shifts that 
it's that's important for us to be mindful of no our faculty have been oriented about these shifts your sons and daughters will get the proper orientation when they begin classes i think it's also important for parents to understand what these shifts are no so what are these shifts i'll talk about four shifts no first we're in the face to face classroom we're all accustomed to think of our courses in terms of sessions. You know? For example, we have two sessions a week or three sessions a week for a total of 54 weeks, you know? uh, uh, for a total of 18 weeks for a whole semester, right? Um, as we shift to the online learning environment, we have to think in terms of modules. You know? And by modules, I mean the modules are already organized. So maybe a three unit course may have six modules, you know? We no longer think of them in terms of sessions because students are allowed to go at their own pace. No? Uh, the moment they've mastered one module, they're free to go on to the next module. No? So it's a more personalized kind of learning. It's a kind of learning we've actually been aiming for all these years. No? So finally, with this online scenario, we can actually try to reach that more. No? Secondly, we're accustomed to thinking in terms of semester in the college. No? And we have the first semester and we're going to stick to that. But one creative approach that we have proposed and I think that's going to happen is that for most of the undergraduate courses, we are going quarterly. What do I mean by that? No? For example, your son or daughter has six courses for one semester. Instead of asking your son and daughter to work on all six courses for the entire 18 weeks of the semester, research has shown us that it's more effective if we can help your sons and daughters focus on a few of these courses during the first quarter of the semester for the first nine weeks and focus on the remaining courses the second part of the semester. So we're gonna think in terms of quarters. So for example, if your children, if your child uh, has six courses for, for the first semester, he or she will be focusing on the first three courses only the first nine weeks and then the remaining courses, the remaining nine weeks. The reason for this is that it's more helpful for your children to have that kind of arrangement. So that's going to be the, the rule. There will be exceptions for certain courses, but in general for the Loyola schools, the courses will be scheduled in terms of quarters. This is something that's more beneficial for our students. No? Third, in terms of class hours, we used to measure the courses in terms of class hours. So three hours per week for a three unit course for a total of 54 class hours for a whole semester or 18 weeks. Now we have to shift from class hours to learning time. What do we mean by learning time? Learning time refers to all the time that the students are in contact with their teachers, but it, in, it also includes all the time the student is going to spend spend you know um uh spend time on tasks you no know, reading re uh, re reading the assignments uh listening to a lecture uh doing group work or group discussion or taking a test or examination so learning time is a more global concept it uh, includes not only the time that the students will be in touch with the teacher online no? which brings me to the fourth uh fourth shift no um a lot of people, when they think of online learning, they think of synchronous sessions. These are, you know, like, like what we're having right now and basically having a synchronous session with you and giving you a short lecture on what Ateneo online education will look like. That's going to be the exception for the, for the coming school year. No? The reason is uh, not only internet or bandwidth because these sessions take up more of that, but research has also shown that students are able to achieve deeper learning when they're doing asynchronous tasks. By asynchronous, I mean that the tasks are already laid out for them, the readings have already been assigned, and at their own time, they will be going through the task and they're given the luxury of spending more time in areas where they need, where they need more time and rushing through areas that they don't need as much time for. You know? So for this reason, we uh, the Loyola Schools is still going to propose a class schedule for example, for one three-unit course, it's possible that there are still three, uh, three classes during the week, but we don't expect your children to be online for all those three hours. Now, most of the time, they will be asynchronous, they will be doing asynchronous tasks, but they should make themselves available for the synchronous sessions that their faculty might ask for. You know? 
So for example, if I'm teaching a class in, let's say, science, technology, and society, you know, let's say I meet, uh, I have a class schedule of Tuesday and Thursday, for example, one o'clock to 2.30, you know, an hour and a half classes. You know? I would expect my students to make themselves available during those one hour and a half, even if I don't intend to meet with them for one and a hour and a half twice a week. I expect them to use that time to do their asynchronous work so that if I call for a synchronous session, they will be available. No? So very briefly, I just like to sort of show you a possible, um, a possible course. So let's say I'm teaching uh, science, technology, and society. No? So if they sign up for the learning management system, this is what they will see. They will get a welcome, no? a welcome to science, technology, and society. If they go to modules, no? they, will see the, they will see the six modules that are lined up. No? For example, for science, technology, and society, it's very possible there's an introductory module. No? And then the first module is the impact of social media. The second module can be the possibility and necessity of scientific thinking. The third module, the goals and methodologies of the sciences, and so on and so forth, no? until the sixth module. No? And, and so what happens here is that the six modules will be made available for the students, and they will use their own pace to go through them. No? But just to give you a sample of the introductory module, no? um, if, you're, if, you're, if the student goes to the course overview, no? there will be the course overview there. No? And basically, it gives an, obviously, it gives an overview of the course. If they press next, no, they will go to, uh, they meet your teacher and classmates. So for example, in this case, I am Father Johnny Go, I am, I'm your teacher, I have, a, I have a horse, I don't own this horse, I just borrowed it for the selfie. No? And then I can talk a little bit about my job, what I expect, what they can expect from me. No? I can talk about our class schedule. This does not mean that we will have an actual virtual class each time for an hour and a half. It means that I have two expectations from you, every TTH from 1.30 to 3 p.m. A, to dedicate the time to this course, the readings, the lectures, and the tasks assigned to you, and B, to make yourself available for any Zoom session I may call for, whether that's for the entire class, for your small group, or for you individually. And then I will share my consultation hours, and I will also say that it's important for them to share with their community, which refers to their classmates. No? If they press next, for example, they will be given their course learning outcomes. No? The syllabus will be attached. They can download the syllabus. So these are the three learning outcomes. And I have here the six modules for the course. In other words, even if I'm not personally talking to them, uh, the learning management system will handhold them and guide them no? as they're going through the course. All they have to do is keep, keep uh, clicking next. No? So for example, they can go to next. No? And here I will clarify the roles, the rules and routines in my class. No? So I'm laying out what I expect from them, what they can expect from one another. No? And then uh, if they want to ask any question, they can actually post their questions here. No? So as you can see, it's quite possible that even if I'm not, fa fa I'm not face to face with them in class, I can pay attention to them. As a matter of fact, I want to say that sometimes uh, it happens that better care and better attention is given online because in a big class, where it's face to face, only the most extroverted speak up. But here, everyone can speak up. No, so so so. In other words, our students can go through that. I just want to give you another sample of a module of an app because these are actually just introductory, no, just an orientation to the class. But if you go to the module, for example, it will always begin with the learning outcomes. We tell them for this module, we expect you. This module is about social media. We expect you to appreciate the impact of social media technology on you individually and on society. And we expect them to manage their personal use of social media in order to reap its benefits and avoid the risks. So they get to know what the learning outcomes are. No? And then a, an example would be they can watch a video. No? This is a video, a TED Talk. No? Watch this 17-minute TED Talk featuring Tristan Harris and his disturbing observations about social media. And then I'll have here a recap. I'll say, you know, I'll summarize what Tristan Harris says. And then I'll say, discuss in no more than 10 sentences, share your reactions and thoughts with your classmates. Don't forget to read and respond to their posts. So they can reply here, you know? And after they reply, they can look at the responses of their, of their classmates and they can like the responses of their classmates. 
and they can also comment. So as you can see, I'm a big believer of asynchronous discussions because compared to a class recitation, the time is more limited and it's always the usual suspects who are speaking up and raising their hands. It's always the extroverts. But my experience teaching online is that more people participate. Everyone participates and everyone is heard no? because you are, you're, you're enabling the, the students to respond to one another. And you as a teacher, even if you're not meeting with them real time, you're also able to respond to their questions or their insights. So that would be one example. One example would be a lecture, a talk on video. Another, another example would be a presentation like this one. No? For example, this presentation is called The Five Endangered Species of the Digital Age. And I have here a slide presentation. And uh, the students can just go through the slides no? on their own. No? I can actually put a recording here no? to accompany them. And then after the slide, I can tell them to take a poll. I can set up a poll and say, for example, given your present lifestyle, which of the five so-called endangered species, in your opinion, needs your most urgent attention and response? The idea of this lecture is for them to think about the dangers of social media, what they tend to lose because they're, if they get addicted to social media. So they take a poll, they can choose from the five. No, So it's um, a fa um, it says here, uh, I can't read this. Uh, truth and thinking is an endangered species. Relationships, no? silence is an endangered species. The sense of the self is an endangered species and values is an endangered species. So they can take a poll no? and then afterwards they'll find out all oh, the class, most of us chose this. And that's already an interesting springboard for discussion. No? And again, there's a discussion here in no more than 10 sentences, explain your choice, what would be a baby step or an initial response that you can consider taking to respond to this realization. And again, they can discuss among themselves. No? So I'm just giving you examples of activities that they may be doing. No? But some of you may be wondering, what about reading? Isn't reading enough? There's a, there, we just saw slides, we saw video. Here's an example. No? So I can provide a link to a chapter from a book by Roy Baskar, for example, called The Realist Theory of Science. And then I'll tell them, make sure you understand what he means by this theory. TMSA, the Transformational Model of Social Action, and that you can apply it in making sense of the relationship between a technology like social media and society. No? And then what they do is they don't just read the PDF. No? I'll ask them to upload the PDF on Nota Bene. Nota Bene is a tool online. No? And what happens is that once they upload the PDF on Nota Bene, uh, the student and his group mates can do active and collaborative reading. What do I mean by this? They can annotate the PDF together. They can highlight the PDF together. They can put their comments in terms of summaries, questions, and other insights. No? I will ask them to invite me to my fellow readers so I can actually check out their inputs if I want to. I can even grade them based on their inputs. So you see this even better than just assigning them a reading as we usually do traditionally because you know, most students won't read. Or if they do, they're not really engaged in deep reading. But all these technological tools can encourage us no, to enable our students to engage in deep and engaged reading, and they work with one another. No? So uh, I can give them videos. I can give them slides. I can also give them the usual text no, in the form of PDF. No? And then in terms of activities, I can give them a quiz just to check if they understood what they've read. No? This is an automated test. In other words, they can... I can give them objective tests and it'll correct itself. No, for example, here, according to Roy Baskar, the individual person can freely manage the effects of social media, true or false. They can answer this, no, there's a time limit. After they answer, they will get the correct answer and they will be told, um, and hopefully they will learn no, because of that. Okay, so that's an example of a quiz. It can be an essay, it can be multiple choice. There are many ways we can design quizzes. No? Another example of an assignment is we can ask the team to create an infographic that not only summarizes what their group considers their most valuable learning about social media, but also to promote greater discernment among students in the Loyola schools in their use of social media. So the task here is, why don't you go on a social media campaign and come up with an infographic? So it's a very real world assessment. No? It's something that they could actually do in real life, but it allows me, the teacher, to check whether they understood the big ideas in this module, and at the same time to check whether they can apply it in real life. 
And my final example, no? Um, my final example would be, uh, let me just go back to the modules, no? Uh, sorry if I'm taking too much time. Oh, that, that's actually my last example. No? So I just wanted to uh, give you an idea of what happens um, uh, what happens when your, your son or daughter goes online. I took a little bit longer than usual, but I think it's important for you to just get a taste. The idea here is there's a repertoire of experiences available to students that are not normally available in the traditional classes. And I think the big thing here is we're given the opportunity to teach our students how to use the internet, not only for socializing or for entertainment, but also for learning. I think it's a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Father Johnny. Um, so we have the initial presentation from Dr. Vilches, and we have uh, Father Johnny Go's presentation on adaptive learning. So now we'll take a few questions before we move to the second presentation of uh, Dr. Vilches. So, so some of you have already uh, indicated your questions on chat. I'll just let Father Johnny catch his breath first and maybe direct a question to Dean Banjo Bautista of SOSE. Uh, somebody's asking about laboratory classes in the first sem. And maybe you uh, can also answer the other question about whether or not remedial classes or makeup classes are mandatory. Hi. Uh, as far as laboratory classes are concerned, we have moved all laboratory classes to the second semester. So there will be no laboratory classes in the intercession and there will be no laboratory classes also for undergraduate students in the first semester. We are hoping that conditions are going to be a lot better in the second semester. So we are arranging the programs of studies of the students to be able to accommodate the changes that have been made. And thus we are moving forward some classes which do not entail laboratories to the first semester so that we can actually move the laboratory classes to the second semester. Uh, what, what's the other question, Leland? Are the remedial classes mandatory, the makeup classes? No, no. The remedial classes are not mandatory. They are vo voluntary, but we want to impress upon the students that for some of them, it will be expected that they do learn what should have been learned in the remedial classes. Thank you, Dr. Bautista. I'll take a few questions myself before I go to Father Johnny. Uh, there were questions about internships. Actually, we released a memo earlier saying that on-site internships will not be allowed this intercession and first semester. So all internship coordinators have been asked to come up with alternatives to on-site internships, which could include online internships, or it could be workshops, career talks, and other such alternatives. So please rest assured that on-site internships will not be allowed. And there was a question about job fairs and programs. The placement office is offering webinars on finding jobs in this online environment. Okay, so I hope that addresses those concerns. Um, maybe we can go to Father Johnny. There are a number of questions here about online learning. Maybe I'll take them two at a time. Um, there are questions about tests, Father. Uh, some students are worried about taking tests in an age where connectivity is not assured. Uh, so how can we assure them ab about that? And a parent is concerned about the susceptibility of online tests to cheating. Okay, so um, the, the answer to the first question, in my experience of giving online assessments, uh, connectivity always becomes an issue. Sometimes it's an excuse. No? Uh, sometimes, you know, a student, even if the student knows ahead of time that there will be an assessment and you've advised them that make sure you have internet uh, access and all that, they always come up with reason. So it's important, I think, on the one hand to um, to be very clear about the schedule of the assessment and what's required. No, but on the other hand, as we said, inclusivity is important. So teacher must exercise 
his or her judgment as to whether to give the student a second chance. To be honest with you, I always give my students a second chance when it's online because that's part of the problem. No? The problem is, uh, the, the problem with these time quizzes is that uh, once the internet gets disrupted, that's the end of it. No? Uh, so I always give a chance to my students. It's a choice I've made on my own, but every teacher will have to make that choice. But I think in, in Loyola schools, I, I just want to point out that the, the, the inclination is to be more compassionate. That's been stressed already. The second thing I want to uh, respond to is about cheating. No, is, is, that, is that right? That's the second yes, question, right? Yes. Yeah, you know, for me, when it comes to online, um, academic honesty is not an end all. No, uh, the reason is obviously you cannot really control everything a hundred percent. But come to think of it, you cannot control everything a hundred percent, even face to face. One of the things that an online teacher should give up is this illusion of control over cheating. We don't have control over cheating, and it's important to give the responsibility to our students and challenge them. To be honest, you know, the reason why I think there's great dishonesty and corruption in this country is that we are always in trying to impose honesty from the outside. You know? uh, so it's important, I think, for us to just keep it real and accept the fact that we don't have full control, but at the same time, challenge our students to be honest. You know? And so in real life anyway, when our students are being tested for their knowledge, skills, and attitudes, they can confer with one another they can check out books, they can Google. So it's really, a, it's a more real world kind of assessment when you think about it. So that doesn't bother me. I know it bothers some teachers, but I think it's an adjustment we have to make. Thank you, Father Johnny. Maybe we'll move to uh, Dr. Hofilenia from Academic Affairs. There's a question about whether or not there will be limits to engaging students. Like for example, will it be limited to class hours? And there's a question about, will there be limits to the number of students per class? Dr. Hofilenia. Uh, we've um, advised our faculty that uh, to, to, to observe class hours. No? Our class hours are between 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, in general. No? So we are expecting that um, consultations, for example, with, with students will always be within those class hours. With regard to the class size, uh, the class size is determined by each department. No? The department is the one that um, um, manages, no? determines the class size based on the number of students that have to take those classes. Thank you, Dr. Hofelenia. Maybe we'll go back to Father Johnny because there are a number of questions about online learning. So somebody wants to know, will there be group learning activities in an online environment? And how do we measure the effectiveness of online learning? Okay, uh, in terms of group activities, yes, that's one of the possibilities. No? That's why class size for me is not a big issue because there can always be well-designed group activities and you just have to provide the right rubrics for that no? to make sure that it's, it becomes effective. No? So yeah, there'll be group activities. And what's the second question, Lilan? Sorry. How do we measure the effectiveness of online learning? The, the, I think the best measure of online learning is the result. No? If, you're, if, you, if the students are able to perform better in the assessments, that means that uh, online learning is more effective. No? Thank you. And uh, maybe two final questions for Father Johnny. Uh, what are the downsides of online learning and how can parents help? Okay, I'll begin with the second question since I'm dealing with the parents. I think uh, the, the parents can help by... Uh, helping the student to define the structure that he or she will need to support them in their online learning. Now, as you know, at home, there's no structure, basically. In school, at least you have the schedule, you have the classrooms, but in the online environment, um, some students may actually think it's up to them whenever they want. Even if there's a class schedule, they may decide not to follow it because the teacher will not always meet with them for the entirety of that class. No? It would be helpful if there's a uh, if, if it's possible to have a definite place and time for the online learning, some kind of structure. No, uh, it's possible. Uh, it would be helpful if parents can be on the lookout on how they can support the students because online learning, uh, studying from home, just like working from home, can be extra stressful as we have all been experiencing. No, because the lines between work and office have been very much blurred. 
So I hope the parents will be supportive and encouraging, no? And uh, as far as those are concerned. The downside, I think the biggest downside is that um, for learning to happen at all, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's outside the classroom or online, uh, it's important for the students to give their consent. Dapat pumayag silang matuto. If they don't give their consent, no amount of song and dance number from the teacher, no amount of fantastic design online or tech technological tools are going to make them learn. So engagement is important. So if the students are not going to make the decision to learn, that's the downside, no? Kasi yun ang problema, kasi we can't force them, right? And second, you can only lead the horse to the water, but you can't, you know, force feed the horse with water or whatever else you want to teach them, no? And um, the other downside, I think, is that there's a greater call for independent learning and discipline online, obviously, which I think is a good thing, no? Because our students are not really accustomed to that, no? They prefer to be spoon-fed, they prefer not to do too much work, but here in online learning, because it's largely asynchronous, they have to discipline themselves more. They have to be more honest. They have to give their consent to learning. They have to be responsible for their learning. So the downside is if they don't decide to be responsible for their learning, they're not going to learn anything. So that's that's the biggest downside. So I mean, what I'm saying, I guess, is there are more potential benefits in online learning as shown by research. You know? But there are also risks and dangers. There are also more risks and dangers. So that's the downside. Thank you, Father Johnny. Um, a question here about thesis writing and defense and how that will be handled. Not sure who can answer that question. Uh, Dr. Hofilenia, you want to take that question? Thesis writing and defense. Lilan, maybe that can be directed to the, to the deans. To the deans. Because maybe. there might be different different um uh ways of dealing with that depending on the school maybe we can start with uh dean aldaba of social sciences uh dean nandi would you like to answer that question on thesis writing and defense in an online environment um for the thesis writing i guess uh just of course it's online and uh the thesis classes will also be not quarterly, but uh, mostly semestral because it will take one semester to do. Um, it, it would take more than a quarter to, to write the thesis. So, for example, in economics, uh, <clears throat> it will be a semester writing the thesis. And of course, the, the teacher will also be available online to advise the students. Of course, they will follow the class schedule now for the defense um it will still be online uh, there there are facilities that uh, and applications where the student can present their thesis uh to to the panel of uh, examiners okay thank you dr aldaba i think the other schools will have similar um procedures for thesis writing and, and defense semestral and then online online defense so i think we can go to mamarlu's second presentation uh, but there was a question here that maybe she can start off with uh, will an assessment be made at some time to figure out what we will do in the second semester and then with that mom maybe can continue with your presentation yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Father Johnny. Thank you, Father Johnny. You've got a syllabus and an, for um, science and technology with you. Thank you so much. And I think it's, it really helps to explain these things from that perspective down to the level of a sample class, because it's, it's, it's a new way of uh, configuring this. And so I think that picture is a very good one. Thank you so much, Father Johnny. Thank you. So, Land, what was that? The, is there going to be an assessment? For uh, yeah, we'll, when will we know about the second SEM? Oh, the second SEM. Within the first SEM, we will know what the second SEM is all about. You know, we, we continue to work uh, on these things as we move along. So, we don't want to skip a process. 
So we want to be very definite, uh, we're very meticulous to um, proceed with, first of all, the intercession and the first semester and then the second semester. We will keep you posted on what the second semester is going to be like. I think everyone, not just the Ateneo, all the educational institutions will not know yet what they're going to do in the second semester or any other company for that matter will probably only have general ideas. So we are not alone here, but we trust that, and I hope you will trust us, that because we are doing a very thorough process of, of you know, in this journey right now, I hope you will trust us that we will do the same for the second semester and beyond. Is that okay? Yes. So I'd like now to turn off my video so that I can upload my presentation again. Okay, I hope you sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. It's not that. It's this. I want to show first the academic calendar. I suppose you have heard from your sons and daughters about the academic calendar. There is already, it's already available on our website, but I am giving you snapshots of what the academic calendar is going to be. For the intercession, and yes, some people were asking, will the intercession be offered? Yes, we're offering the intercession. That's from July the 6th to the 12th of August, instead of the original June to July schedule. And the first semester has got these dates from the 26th of August to the 23rd of December, instead of 12 August to 12 December. And the second semester will be from mid-January to the end of May. We are following the original schedule for the second semester. So it's really the entire year of 2020 whose schedules are a little bit changed. For the intercession, this is where we have what we have. We start class on the 6th of July, and we have final oral and written exams on August 10 and August 12 to August 12. And then we end our classes on the 12th of August. This is the registration. There will be all the registration activities will be online. So this is for the intercession from June 30 to July 3 will all be online. You will see the different batches there of undergrads and grads. And then there's a free for all day and time. And then we and then the batch three and batch four would be the um, similar ones. OK. For the, sorry, the, the first one is round one. The second one is round two. We, sorry, the undergrads here, I'm sorry. This is, there, there is a, there is a specific set of year, number of years. I think, I'm, I'm sorry, this is the wrong one that I have here. But the batch four and three will be, Anyway, JJ will correct this later on. I made this one for the other presentation, so I did not put here the undergrad, which level, which year level. But let, let me just go back to the first. Batch one and batch two would be the lower years. Batch three and batch four would be the upper years. Batch four and batch three would be the upper years, and batch two and batch one would be lower years for round two. Ma'am, may I, may I? May yes, I, uh... JJ. Yes. yes. Um, I, I need to correct you, ma'am. No? The there will be no uh, there will be no notion of year levels in the intercession registration period. The entire entire academic the entire student body, regardless of year level, will be will be divided into four. Twenty five percent. So they so they will be coming into the ICS system twenty five percent at a time. The okay. undergrads. 
So batch one will be 25% of the students, batch two will be the next 25%, batch three will be the next 25%, and batch four will be the last 25%. Uh, we're going to be doing it this way so the system does not get inundated with students. The grad students can come in any time they want. Uh, oh. For fairness, when round two comes along, batches will be reversed. Okay. So those who went, who those who came in first in the first bat, in the first round of internet enrollment would be coming last, and the last will be first. So there's fairness. All right, talking. thank you, thank you, thank you, Jay, thank you. So for the first semester, uh, this is where we have the year levels. Okay, for the first semester, we will only have one registration period, 18 to 25 August. Even if we divide the semester into two quarters. The students will register for all those courses only at one time. So by the beginning of the semester, they will already know which courses are for the first quarter and which courses are for the second quarter. So this is the um, online enrollment for round one. We begin with the first year students and then with the seniors, juniors and the sophomores at the last one. For round two, we have this um, as well. Okay. This is the first semester schedule. We begin on the 26th for the first SEM first quarter. And then down to end of the first quarter on October the 24th. We begin the second quarter on October 28th, so there's a gap in between, a rest, a break for students especially, and for teachers to be able to do grades and all the rest of it. And then we end it on December the 19th. So actually this one was already looked at by Father Johnny earlier, that we're dividing the semester into two quarters. Dr. Aldaba already said something about thesis that will not be actually, there are courses that cannot reasonably be finished within one quarter and they're exempted from the quarterly arrangements. So thesis, dissertation, capstone, practicum, research courses, etc. And then we're saying that we're fully online in the intercession in the first semester and then there will be possibly classes for only grad students in the second semester, uh, in the second quarter of the first semester. And the guidelines are going to be worked out by the science and engineering school. So as I said, the calendar is on the website. It's, it's accessible uh, by anybody. So you can also have a look at that as well. Okay, what have we done? in relation to knowing what our where our students are. So we've done surveys on connectivity and gadgets for online learning. The Office of the Associate Dean for Student and Administrative Services has been very busy with getting information from our students via these posts. So as of June 1, these are the data that we have 36% response rate with 3,446 respondents out of 9,500 students surveyed. As you can see, we have um, the multiple devices is the one that's at the top. Um, there are smartphones, there are laptops, and so on and so forth. Then, so, uh, these kinds of data we take into consideration as well so that we know where our students are and what we might be able to do to help them. So in terms of tech support for students for online learning, we will be lending out laptops. The priority will be given to scholars. The laptops are from the different labs or offices. Um, I think we have done this one even during the lockdown in the second semester. We already, the Office of Admission and Aid already lent laptops to scholars. 
We're also looking at lending globe or smart devices to students who need connectivity, and we're providing a load of 500 a month. Again, based on the survey and the scholars will be a priority here about the connectivity. We, we can have um, the, a router or um, bucket Wi-Fi. We lend to the students. These are properties of the university, but we lend to the students who need them. And then we provide them with a load of 500 a month. In the in the, the some of the questions that were asked by the parents was one of one of these was what's needed in online learning. Of course, laptop, desktop, and connectivity, but important as well is conducive atmosphere for study. Father Johnny was already talking about that earlier. But if it's possible to allot a space for study, maybe not just a space, a physical space, but an emotional space, um, a quiet, sacred space and time, and support from parents. Because more than, more than anything else, even if they have the technology, if there is no atmosphere for the study, maybe the technology will not do the job. These are some of the concerns that were surfaced by students based on our survey. They're concerned, they're, they're about motivation. They, they are not, they might not be as motivated as they are when they are face to face in the classes because they meet their classmates. But I think what we can do to address the motivation is if you look at what Father Johnny gave us that is an example of what online learning and studying is all about. We feel that our students who are connected more with, who are savvy with online stuff, might even be more motivated to study given the kind of design that our students are being coached to do for online learning. There's also anxiety, anxiety in general, anxiety over financial situation of the family. Your sons and daughters are concerned about this. They might not verbalize this to you, but if they hear the family talk about this, it's not just about they hear, but they feel that that is a situation that has to be considered, especially if businesses are down, they're anxious about it. So it might be good if you could talk to them and surface that kind of anxiety instead of them just battling it down in themselves because because students can feel guilty you know that they are the families incurring a lot of expense because of their education so there that's the kind of anxiety that they have so it might it, you might need to get, give support to them by surfacing that and talking to them about it feelings of depression maybe because of anxiety, lack of motivation, and so on and so forth. People who have mental health issues might have feelings of depression. Fear of the pandemic that can cause anxiety, depression, lack of motivation, fear of the pandemic. I think it's important for them to know the facts, not to listen to all of these types of news that are always scary, but to know the facts that come from WHO or DOH or at the university we have a blue board that issues uh, regularly the information from our university physician and I think that's going that's going to be accessed by the Sangonian and they can get that kind of information as well. It's important for them to understand not just to to panic because um, there's a lot of negativity around us already. So good information is important for that. There's also, uh, they're concerned about the lack of boundaries. As I said earlier, the idea of a physical space and emotional space is important. They feel that there is a lack of boundary, their lack of privacy in their own home space. In fact, one of the concerns that was brought up by the Office of Guidance and Counseling, because during this time, the Office of Guidance and Counseling has been doing online consultation with students, following up especially those who have uh, anxiety, depression, etc. 
But the problem with the, the problem there is that they feel they have no privacy at home to talk about their situation. So if parents can um, help with that, give them a space, it would be good. Family problems also bother them. Well, perhaps when we were all we were always on site and they come to the university physically, they feel that they're away from problems that beset them when they're at home. But now that they are studying from home, it's a little difficult as well for them. So maybe just become aware that this is a concern that's been brought up by students. They're also stressed over the political climate, what's happening in our society is very stressful for them. They're also stressed about grief. They're, they're grieving over loss of loved ones or maybe grieving over loss of maybe not necessarily those close to them, but what's happening with people who are sick uh, because of COVID-19 and, and the rest of it. So this is an entire set of concerns and we're bringing this up to you so that you, you know what your sons and daughters have in mind that they might not be able to verbalize and that you might be able to, to help. Okay, so having said all of that, I want now to look at tuition and fees and tuition and fees for the intercession of 2020-2021. I'm talking about intercession only for now because the university is looking at our budget per quarter. I'll the Board of Trustees says that we cannot really take a look at an entire year's budget because a lot of things are moving. So to be more realistic about things, we look at things quarterly or maybe from the perspective of learning and teaching, we look at things for, per term. So the intercession is one term and the, sec the first semester is another, the second semester is another term. So for now, what we can, <clears throat> what we can tell you is tuition and fees for the intercession 2020-2021. Before the, even during the lockdown, or last year we made our budget for this year and we proposed a 6% increase. That 6% increase was actually approved by CHED, <clears throat> but we're not implementing the approved increase by CHED. So what's happening is that tuition for the entire year, not just for the intercession, tuition for the entire year will stay at the same level as 2019 and 2020. <clears throat> we are also restructuring the intercession fees. So this will also go for the fees for the first semester and the second semester. We're, we're restructuring these. So for now, what I'm going to let you know is about the intercession fees. But the ones here, the three items here, are the main principles by which we, we go for the restructuring of all the fees this school year. <clears throat> so that the fees, <clears throat> excuse me, should reflect better the service to be provided to the students, given that intercession will be completely online, or maybe even saying given that <clears throat> the first semester later on will be completely online. <clears throat> Unnecessary fees will be removed and resources will be directed to services necessary to the delivery of efficient and effective education, such as online infrastructure, infrastructure and health and wellness. There will be fees which will not as be as um, needed as much. So, for example, facilities and maintenance fees, these will be reduced. <clears throat> so the fees that will not be charged for the intercession are student activity fee and the computer lab fee, because there will be no um, lab, computer labs courses. The fees that will be reduced for the intercession are the registration fee, facilities maintenance fee, and energy fee. These two items are new in our categories, health and wellness, and online infrastructure. 
We never budgeted anything related to online infrastructure before. Health and wellness, we had a little bit, but not as much. But as you can see, these two items, these two services consist of the bulk of the services for students this entire school year, especially online infrastructure. So what is happening is that for those fees that have been reduced or have not been charged, they are going to be placed under these, between these two, health and wellness and online infrastructure. Okay, so if the, in relation to the, in relation to the approved fees by CHED, <clears throat> our actual tuition fee now is reduced by approximately 5.7%, and the fees are reduced by approximately 15.5%. <clears throat> The net effect on tuition and fees based on the 2019 and 2020 rates would be this. Tuition stays the same and fees are reduced by approximately 11%. We have some payment schemes. We, we are, um, we have, we're trying to design a lot more flexible payment schemes. Currently, there is um, an online payment system with the banks that still continues. There are also scholarships. We're trying to have more scholarships for students, as more scholarship campaigns for students. I know that there are students who are asking for scholarships. And because we really are a private institution and we don't have any subsidy from government, we're trying our best to solicit more scholarships and really work within our means, work within the resources that we have. We are working also now on an online credit card payment system that is going to be piloted, I think, within the month, and we're going to announce this to the parents, the students and the parents, once that pilot has already been done. <clears throat> We're studying the possibility of student loans. Again, it still depends on our resources, because when you say student loans, it means that you have stashed away some money for those loans. And we don't know. We'll have to look at that, because the university is actually being challenged financially as well. I know I don't know if you have looked at the memo of Father Jet. Father Jet in a memo said that we are opening credit lines with banks. That's that tells you about our own financial status as a university. But even within this, we're trying to we're trying to continue to offer services to especially to scholars and to students by using this flexible payment schemes, et cetera. So the student loan, maybe, but that's still being studied depending, depending on our resources. So that's so far in relation, but there are other, there, I know that there are other concerns later on. Some of these have been already surfaced. I got this from the questions of the parents. They're asking about what we're going to do when we're back in place, for example, the second semester. We'd like to let you know that there's an entire group that's working on reimagining physical spaces in the Loyola schools, observing health protocols, physical distancing, and so on and so forth. That's being worked on. That also entails expense because, for example, in a classroom where you can have 50 people, you can no longer have 50 people in that classroom. You can only have 15 at the most. So we are, we are challenged with physical spaces and we will look at structures that will help us, that will help us demarcate maybe spaces. So that's a separate matter. It's an entire work that's being done. We're preparing for the second semester at least. So uh, we want to assure you that, that this is work in progress but this is work that is thoroughly 
being planned in progress. Mental health issues also came up. And as I said earlier, our guidance and counseling and our health services, they have been continuing to do online service to the students for this. And they will have programs that will be created. Maybe later on they can say something more. Lab courses, um, that's already been discussed. JTA, some people are asking, will there still be JTA, the Junior Term Abroad Program or any student mobility programs? For the first semester, at least, we are suspending the Junior Term Abroad Programs. We're suspending internationalization for the first semester while we concentrate on our implementation of the online program. So, but maybe we can start in the second semester. Immersions, maybe Lan can say something about this later. Org, orgs, orgs life, whatever um, we're doing for that, maybe that can be dealt with later as well. There's a question about monitoring and tracing capability of the university. Um, maybe Shaw can say something about that if he's here, or, or health services, maybe. Obtaining records from the registrar's office, maybe JJ Agtarap can say that something about that later. Having access to library materials, Dr. Von Tutanis, the, the director of the library, can say something about that. So maybe I will just end with that for now because the others have already been talked about. And then we can pause for questions. Okay, pa. thank you, Ma'am Marley. So we'll take a couple of questions. I mean, we will start with JJ, uh, the registrar. There's a question about records. Um, and then there's a question about how batch numbers are assigned. Good afternoon. Oh, good morning. Uh, uh, we're happy to inform the group you know, that by we're happy to inform the group that by the end of June 2020, we are going to be issuing, we're going to be able to, we're going to be able to issue official electronic transcripts of records. These will not be provisional transcripts of records. These will be official transcripts of records, which will be sent to, which can be sent to anyone who requests for it to their official Ateneo email addresses or to a personal address if the person requesting can provide a government-issued ID. That is what will replace our hard copy transcripts while the pandemic is going on. No? Uh, it, it's, it, this isn't something that's going to be done temporarily. It's going to be available forever. Uh, it's going to be uh, tentatively priced at half the cost of a hard copy of your transcripts. As I said, this will not be this will not be a provisional document. This will be an official document. We've experienced uh, for many of the employers that, co that, that correspond with the Loyola Schools Registrar's Office that now more than ever, they request for electronic copies of the, of the scholastic documents of our students and not hard copies. So we're responding to that by making available starting the end of June electronic copies, official electronic uh, copies of the student transcripts. I think the second question had to do with batch the second numbers. question had to do with batch numbers. Now, for the intercession, as I said, there will be no notion of year level. What will happen is the, the entire student body will be divided into four. How we determine who's going to be in one, batch one, batch two, batch three, batch four? The student information system will randomly will uh, will randomly batch the students from to, from, from to into batch one, batch two, batch three, or batch four. Um, it's, there's, there, there is not going to be any charity towards anyone. It's going to be a, you can liken it to an, to an electronic tambiolo. So any student from any year level can be either batch one, batch two, batch three, or batch four, depending on how ISIS will, will uh, rumble the numbers, so to speak. We're going to be releasing the batch numbers to the students by next week, shortly before registration, so they're aware about what batch number they'll be at. Thank you, Mr. Agtarap. Um, I'll take a couple of questions mentioned by Ma Marlu and other questions before I turn over to Dr. Totanes of the library. Um, in a nutshell, all co-curricular activities will be online, so there will be no co-curricular activities on site. This is true for student org activities. 
Uh, this is true for all exposure and immersions. Uh, they will be replaced by online engagements with communities and institutions. Uh, this is true for all recollections and retreats, as mentioned earlier, also for internships. Uh, PE classes will be conducted online, and fortunately, and fortunately, a lot of our PE faculty have experience in online training. Athletics training will be done online, and even uh, discipline matters will be handled online. Okay, so just to answer a whole set of concerns regarding co-curricular activities. Now, Dr. Itotanes, what about library access? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, actually, I'd like to let the parents know that at this point, uh, if, there's, if their children were enrolled during the second semester, uh, they can still access the library's resources until August, regardless of whether they uh, enroll for intercession or not. Uh, and, and how is this working? Uh, it's, it's an online access to the library's resources to the databases that we have. And uh, aside from that, you know, uh, we, have, we have more than 30 databases uh, which cover all the disciplines of the Loyola schools. Uh, Aside from that, uh, students can easily email or, or reach our librarians uh, through our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, those are for the online resources. Uh, recently, we started providing access to materials that are available online. Uh, uh, sorry that are available on campus because for our, our employees have already been able to enter. Uh, we're still rolling that out slowly. Uh, we will eventually uh, provide an online form where students and other members of the Loyola schools can, can request uh, digital copies of materials that are available only on campus within, you know, within reasonable and legal limits. Um, if, however, the question is related to actual visits to the campus to, to do research on campus, uh, I think that will take a little more time. Um, we are already working out uh, protocols on how uh, visitors can enter the campus, uh, request materials 24 hours in advance so that we can prepare the materials. Uh, but um, that will take a little more time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tatanes. There was a question for Father Johnny, but I think Father Johnny is not with us anymore. Uh, maybe Dr. Vilches can take the question. Um, there's a suggestion. What, what can you say about the suggestion not to continue with classes until conditions are improved? Sorry, not to continue classes until... Con conditions have improved. Have improved. Well, our response to that is, in, in a sense, we're not continuing classes on site for continuing classes online because it's also a way of, um, and then we have created a robust way of online learning. It's not just any online learning method that we have imported from elsewhere and copied elsewhere from elsewhere. It's really an online method that's tailor made for Ateneo education so that we can continue to offer robust education even online for our students. That's our response to instead of saying stop it, we continue, but we continue in a different mode. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Vilches. Uh, there's a question by Mr. Caro. Will students be given FAQs as well to, re to prepare them and manage their expectations? And I think Dr. Tolosa has an answer. Dr. Tolosa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yes, uh, there there will be a primer uh, that will be released, uh, and it will contain uh, answers to questions. Um, there's also the question about uh, whether to continue education. I think the part of that had to do with the question of whether uh, some students may decide or families may decide not to continue education of their children until they wait uh, until uh, a time when the situation normalizes. Um, of course, students can go on LOA, but the problem is that we really don't know uh, what the situation will be. So I think th that's a serious question of uh, what what do you do? No? So, so that's why I think we've really tried our best to, to develop uh, a real design for online learning so that the same kind of education that we provide uh, will be available online. Uh, so, so in other words, that, that decision to postpone uh, because they're worried that, uh, I mean, that learning will not be the same is, is something that uh, I think we will have to face, you know, that we really are in a situation where uh, it's, it's a new normal, as it were. You know? so, so I think that that's, that's one kind of response. Of course, another possible reason has to do with finances, no? but I think we, that can also be addressed no, by, by the school. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tolosa. Um, are there any other questions? I see a question here about sports, which I'll get to in a while, but maybe after this, uh, Mr. San Andres can talk about the dorm and the available facilities. Okay, after I respond to this question about sports, uh, the thinking right now is that definitely there will not be any sports events this coming first semester. So what we're preparing for is the possibility that sports events will resume in the second semester. That's why the athletes are continuing with their training and, and conditioning. But that's still a big if uh, they do resume in the um, second semester. All right. Um, Mr. San Andres, you want to talk about the dorm briefly and maybe invite some parents to have their uh, children stay in the dorm? Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Land. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to respond to one of the concerns uh, from one of the parents who um, checked out uh, things. Uh, I believe it was the last June 3. Um, we have shut down actually operations of the university dorm temporarily because we're down to basically currently we have 24 uh, overstaying dormers and some of them have open-ended uh, intentions um, because they're still uh, waiting um, how things will turn out. So the university dorm has been shut down and all the remaining dormers along with guards and uh, cafeteria staff that we're giving free lodging to because of the conditions Everyone is in the Servini Hall, um, and Aliazo has been vacated also. So we are intending to um, set aside the university dorm as our uh, quarantine area, or possibly the area for those who wish to come in and would want to undergo um, two-week quarantine or shorter uh, with COVID testing. Um, so we want to keep um, certain areas available for not just students, but also for even employees. But the basic thing that we'd like to offer is we have safe and well-equipped uh, facilities here so that people do not have to contend with uh, all the worries of having to commute every day. So we'd like to make that available. Uh, we are preparing it, but currently we're still dealing with uh, things that have been abandoned or left behind. So we're in the process of the Package, packing and retrieval of things. So we're hoping that everything will be ready by uh, middle of July at the earliest, but possibly August in time for the first semester, if students will be allowed to travel by the IATF. So yes, our facilities, we're preparing them for that. Thank you, Mr. San Andres. Especially for those with uh, limited internet connectivity where you are, you might want to consider having your children in the dorm, which has stable internet okay are there any other questions from our our parents or any other concerns that the administrators would like to to address
Oh, there was a there was a question earlier for Mr. Tirol about appeals for admission, and I suppose also uh, scholarship. Are those still open, Mr. Tirol? Yeah, uh, Lilan, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, for admissions for freshmen. For freshies, yeah. Uh, we have we have already reached deadline for people for late applications, so no more uh, as of no now. More. Okay. But for upperclassmen who are still looking for scholarship application, we have until July fifteen for upperclassmen. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, there are two questions here. Will there be a foreign exchange student program? I think it was announced earlier that the JTA students cannot go out. Okay, so there will be no JTA. But what about inbound uh, foreign exchange students? And then a question about the connection allowance of 500. Maybe, Mamarlu, would you like yeah, to... For the, for the foreign exchange student, we're suspending that for the first semester at least. We're suspending that because we want to focus our energies on our new mode of learning. You know, It's the same teachers that deal with these people. So we don't want to dissipate energies. The other one is how can we apply for connection allowance of 500? This is based on the list of scholars. And I think we have mechanism for that. There is a um, system that's going to be routed around. I don't, I don't have the exact details of that now, but I think the students will be reached by the Loyola schools so that they will know what sort of application they need. Thank you, Dr. Vilches. Uh, Mr. Terrell, some more questions for you. Are there changes in the schedule and setup of Ateneo admissions? Oh, for incoming, uh, for the next school year? For school year 2021. Yeah, we are going to be opening application period early August, and then it will continue all the way to, I think, mid-October. And then asset will asset is tentatively set for early November. And will it be online? No, on site we are we are scheduling an on site asset in the in November. In November, as of now, uh, we're still waiting for. Of course, it's still um, contingent on whether or not people can still go to campus by that time. Okay, thank you, Doctor Iterol. There's a follow up question here. Policy change for existing scholars on tuition fees and scholar allowances. Is there a policy change for existing scholars on tuition fees and scholar allowances? Uh, we will no longer be having food allowance in the meantime, since we're uh, off-site. But we're trying to convert that into internet allowance instead. Uh, dorm allowance also, if there are no dorms, there'll be no need for dorm allowance also. But uh, we'll see what we can do about things like book allowance in the meantime. Thank you, Dr. Tirol. Uh, Mr. San Andres, just a quick question. What about the things left in the dormitory? When, when can they get those? Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Kisida. The packing, retrieval, and storage of dormers' personal belongings is actually ongoing. We started last uh, June 1, was it June 1? Um, and uh, communication has been sent and this uh, continues to be sent to individual dormers so that they can state their preferences if they're coming over if they're sending a proxy if they're requesting us to do the packing for them and store them or ship them so um, kindly inform your uh, children who are dormers to um, monitor their email um, and then to communicate directly with the residential life managers if there are detailed instructions special instructions that they wish um, it's a very detailed process um, and then people who come here have to undergo the health uh, protocols that we have on campus including the dorm and i'd like to mention very specifically those who come over have to have separate fresh sanitized set of clothes separate from what they wore because they have to take a shower before entering the buildings to remove the possible fomites from the body we have very strict rules here because we have uh, residents or interns who are still here Okay, um, um, monitor the email, please, of your uh, children. Thank you, Mr. San Andres. Uh, Dr. Tirol, there's a question that you might want to answer on chat. 
And then, Dr. Hofilenia, maybe you can take this question. How about for those students who would like to shift courses? When can the student do that? And if you have any other announcements related to academics, Dr. Hofilenia? Uh, with regard to shifting, uh, we released a, uh, there's a, the shifting deadline for intercession is over. But for those who want to shift effective the first semester, we're already accepting uh, requests to shift. Now, the students know how to do this. We released um, a memo about uh, the process, the adjusted process for shifting. Um, and then what's the other, there, there's also, uh, leave of absence was mentioned a while ago. We released a memo last, I think yesterday, to inform students that if they intend to go on a leave of absence in the first semester, or the deadline for making that request is the end of the month, no, June 30. Thank you, Dr. Hofelenia. Maybe one more question for you. Will there still be Latin honors for 2020 graduating batch, considering they receive a passing grade only for this semester? Yes, there will. Uh, the, um, la the graduation honors is based on a cumulative QPI. So uh, for the cumulative QPI, that will include all the grades that they earned from first year up to uh, the first semester of uh, their fourth year. However, that's for students who have P grades. No? Uh, however, as Dr. Vilch just mentioned a while ago, some uh, the, the option was given for graduating seniors to request for letter grades for the second semester. And so if they requested for letter grades, then their cumulative QPI will include the grades from the second semester. So yes, there will be Latin honors. Thank you, Dr. Hofelenia. Uh, Ms. Salita, Associate Dean for Student Administrative Services has um, an announcement to make. Uh, yes, thank you, Lan. Good morning, parents. May we just uh, we would like to request for your help to inform your children to check their OBF emails as well for the surveys that need to be accomplished. So far, we have deployed three uh, surveys that tackled um, gadget, internet, and other uh, enrollment uh, information. So thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe a question for Dr. Vilches. Will there be an online orientation for the Freshie parents? Yes, we're organizing an online orientation for parents. So we're coordinating with ASPAC. Um, that's in order. Yes, we need to do that. Thank you, Dr. Vilches. Any more um, last minute questions for the administrators? Land? Um, yes, Renee. Um, just a reminder for the parents, because we have encountered some problems as regards info, uh, data, contact details. Uh, kindly inform your children, or remind them to check the contact information they placed in the ICs. Uh, there were some students who, or dormers who had problems because they had erroneous cell phone numbers or email um, addresses. So they did not receive the communications we sent. It was just a handful, but it keeps happening apparently every semester to some of you. Thank you. Lan, just, just, yes, on the email, mm. just on the email addresses of our students, now that we have a um, dedicated learning management system, the learning management system will only take OBF email addresses of students, not any of those other email addresses. So please, every student has an OBF email address, so they cannot say they don't have it. So please tell your students, your sons and daughters, use their OBF email addresses. Otherwise, they will not receive any information that's important from us, and then they cannot enter into the learning management system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vilches. Maybe one last question before we wrap up. Um, there's a question here. My son's IPS does not require intercession. What does he need to do to enroll? Uh, maybe Dr. Hofelenia, not required to take intercession, but wants to enroll. Uh, your son or daughter should um, inquire from his or her home department because in order for to enroll in the intercession, the student needs to be advised. So if the student is not required to take intercession, then he has no advisement. Um, if the student wants to, let's say, take advanced classes or take back subjects, 
then the student needs to go to the home department so that uh, he or she can be advised for the intercession. Thank you, Dr. Hofelenia. Maybe we can wrap up. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending this session. Uh, we can wrap up with a few words. Maybe first from Andrew of ASPAC, uh, the president of ASPAC, and then from Dr. Vilches. Andrew, would you like to say a few words to your fellow parents? Please unmute yourself, Andrew. Uh, I'd like to, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'd just like to thank the parents who uh, I've seen a lot of interest. Uh, and I am also thankful to the administration for conducting this uh, forum because it does uh, reassure a lot of the parents. Uh, I think it puts them in a uh, happy uh, frame of mind that. Um, education still continues and that I think they can be very hopeful for the future uh, given that the situation does not provide a lot of hope. There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and again, I'm thankful for the administration and for every, all, all of, uh, who are on online and I'm thankful to the parents who have uh, joined us. There was a little, I mean, um, I think the overflow, there are so many who wanted to uh, join the forum but were unable to because uh, for one reason or the other. So yeah, um, I think it was a very good forum. A lot of uh, questions uh, and uh, doubts were um, answered. Huh? So yun, yun thank, thank you. you. And I hope thank you. the interest continues. Thank you, Mr. Andrew. When uh, Dr. Vilches, uh, your parting words. So thank you, thank you very much. This is very heartening that we have uh, this indicates to us that we have the support of parents, and you can be assured that we are in support of you and especially focused on the education of your children. There is a parent here who I will not name who emailed to say that she was my student in freshman year back in the 80s. That shows you where I was at that time. I was a young teacher in the English department and she was in my class and she says she has students in the Ateneo. She, she says that at that time she was, she was a recipient of my concern as a teacher for her but now that I continue to have concern for the students, so she feels heartened by that. So thank you very much. I will not name her because I don't want to embarrass her. So thank you. Then um, this is, should not be the last that we're going to uh, have a session like this. This is very important. I emailed you, uh, I also put on that, uh, the chat panel, the email address of my office that you can email to, you know, um, suggestions, concerns, etc. Please feel free to do that. Now that we are on online mode, there is more, there is more um, space for this kinds of conversation. I will also, some people are asking about how they can watch the live stream on the, the face. I think Leland put the link there, but I also will clean up my PowerPoint presentation. I'm so sorry for all the glitches that went on the, the slides because I was working on it at, in the wee hours of the morning, so I couldn't, I couldn't look at all the details. But I'm going to clean up my presentation so I can send it to you, um, maybe through, through the, 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 the email addresses that we sent you, or to whom we sent you the information for this meeting. So that's a promise I made. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to Leland for moderating. Thank you, Land. He has been, uh, he has earned another role and will receive an award for service for that excellent role that he has been playing all the time. Uh, I'd like to thank also the deans who, and the other administrators. Joyce Alita has been working a lot on student service and land also on formation and the deans have been very busy 
and all the other administrators, the registrar's office, JG Akhtarab, the library, uh, Dr. Bontutanis, the guidance and counseling, all everybody has been working in their quiet ways so that we as a whole, as a community, can, can have a good support system for your sons and daughters and our students. Again, thank you and have a um, peaceful, happy, healthy, safe life. We will see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Have a good day.